Well, here we are again, Wednesday, on the Big Island, coming live with Hawaii, the state of clean energy. And I'd like to uh, do a shout out to our sponsor, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, and also our funder, the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. So we're really lucky today to have uh, the Legacy Found, uh, the Legacy Reef Foundation Legacy and Reef. the two founders, the co-founders. I have uh, Bill Coney and I have uh, Suzanne Otera yeah. and they're the, they're the co-founders. And kind of the tagline of this uh, show is uh, building reefs today to feed generations forever. So let's find out what that's all about. So first of all, Bill, uh, why did you uh, found the uh, Legacy Reef Foundation? So um, tell us a little bit about that. It's a great question. I grew up in the islands, and I remember as a kid uh, what the marine life was like and the coral. And as we got older, if I got older here, I realized that things were not going to be the same. When I retired about six, seven years ago, I realized that things had really taken a nosedive. And I'm not a scientist. I'm a technical person. But I realized there was a problem. Uh, and I came up with an idea of trying to go out and try to rebuild some of the reefs in front of where I live. Because uh, I now have grandkids, my thought was if I could maybe get a little patch of reef to come back the way it was, I could take them out and show them Papa Willie's Reef, that's what they refer to me as. Okay. So I started out as a, as a dream, and through that process, um, I went to the state to get permits. Uh, I worked as a consultant with a company called the, um, was it the Memorial Reefs uh, International, who was doing the artificial reef building, and they were attempting right. to do in Hawaii. After a couple of years of working with them, uh, I realized that there was an issue out there far beyond just building artificial reefs. They've gone on doing a great job around the world. Right. Uh, but working through the scientists that they had, I realized that there was a problem and that maybe we could fix it. Okay. They came to me and said, you're a business guy, we're scientists, let's work together. And so we, uh, or I decided at that point to try to, to build a coral restoration lab. During that time, I ran into Suzanne on a coral or a reef that, plate. That was my next question. Well. Yeah, we <laughs> ran into each other. We were both scuba divers, and we were right. down doing a beach cleanup one day, and yeah. she was over here on vacation and had done coral restoration work. And I thought that's fantastic. Oh, no she actually had experience. She's a retired physician, so she has a medical background. Right. So we went out for coffee, and I said, well, why don't you come out here and uh, let's open up the lab? So you're going to do some triage on the reefs. Is that's, that correct? That's Suzanne? exactly yeah, the case. I mean, so where, where did you get your experience on building reefs previously? I work with the Coral Restoration Foundation in the, in Florida as a volunteer. Yeah, where, where about in Florida? It's in Key Largo. Oh, okay, nice yeah. spot, yeah. Yeah, it is a nice spot. I was actually uh, considering moving over there and then doing a full-time volunteering. Right. So I was uh, scouting that area. Right. And in between that scouting, I came here for a vacation and then found this opportunity to do it full time through, you know, from the ground up. Okay, excellent, excellent. So one, one of the things I'm curious about is, um, you know, from your website now, why, why, was, why will this feed, feed people and generations in the future? I mean, what's, what's the magic sauce about, about reefs? <laughs> yeah, How do a, they do that? Well, that's a great question. The, the issue is right now our reefs are dying off. It's, it's no yeah. surprise to anybody we've all watched, seen the news. We, we've lost 60, 70 percent of the reefs around the world. Well, they also support the, the, the reef fish that are there, which support the larger fish. For us in Hawaii, it's it's uh, it's unfortunate, but it's not life threatening. We have Costco, we have places we can buy food and right. fish. But in villages and in, in islands like uh, Fiji and Samoa, and, and the South Pacific Islands, the people depend on the reefs. I had a chance right. to talk with the, the Prime Minister of uh, Papua New Guinea, mm -hmm. and he said his number one concern was feeding his people because he lost all his reefs. So it's a serious problem. Really. So our goal is to go down to these areas, take the technology that we've learned. Uh, and perfected here at this lab, and uh, and basically uh, open a coral nursery down there. So tell us about a coral nursery. I mean, how does that work? <laughs> well, you have we, a bunch of baby corals, and we have a bunch of baby corals uh, through the process of coral fragmenting, which is something that she had learned to do in Florida. We take the really strong, resilient corals that are existing right now after the bleaching events, whatever is left, is sort of nature's uh, cream of the crop. Right. So we take those and we fragment them with tiny little pieces the size of your thumbnail and then glue them onto little rocks. And I think we have a picture here, if we could bring right. up slide two, uh, is a great representation of what it looks like. There we go. Look like uh, chocolate chip cookies or yeah. like muffins. Just yeah. about, but they're little baby corals and they're doing great. Uh, and this is, this is a shot of our lab manager down there, Andrea, and uh, those are our little babies. So that's the technology that we use. It's not that complicated, it's been around 20 years. Yeah. 
what we're trying to do is make it practical and easy to do. Right. So we have containerized lab modules that we'll be building. Uh, we're looking to do this Fiji at Fiji first next year, and then I'll be on that, Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea. We're looking at Indonesia, Caribbean, and eventually the Mediterranean. So can you actually grow enough seeds like this to repopulate a reef? I mean, it seems like, you know, I mean, reefs are big. So do they like self-propagate or how do you get new strains in there? Well, they do. Um, but through the process of, of the coral fragmentation, basically we can do what, what nature takes 20 years to do, we can do in two to three years. All right. So granted, we cannot replace thousands of acres of reefs, but if we do pockets along the coastline, they will eventually grow together. Okay. So that's the idea. And also we're using these resilient corals so they hopefully will withstand the, the heating events, the bleaching events that we're going to see in the next 50 to 100 years. So what's the hope? I mean, are you seeing resilient coral out there? Are they kind of adapting? And, and how do you find them? Well, after a bleaching event, whatever's left, we consider the, the strongest of the bunch. Right. And so we take those to the fragmenting process. And also in our labs, we, we use techniques of spiking the heat during the day we can actually make them stronger. I see. Uh, and I call it assisted evolution. Our scientists don't like that term, but it's, it is it's what yeah. I call it. It yeah. makes sense to me. But we speed up the process of evolution that uh, it's been doing for millions of years. Uh, coral is resilient, and given time, it can, resil it can adapt on its own. Right. The problem we've seen in the last 1,500 years is these coral bleaching events are happening so fast and they're so intense, coral can't keep up with it. What is a coral? I hear coral bleaching. I think of Clorox or you know something like that. I mean, what 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 causes it? And, and I'll tell you what. I'm going to ask Suzanne to, yeah. to uh, answer that. That's a little. That's a good technical question. Yeah. So coral bleaching. The coral works um, is an is an animal, and it it has inside um, a microalgae okay. that gives it the color, and they work in symbiosis. So they the microalgae uh, does the photosynthesis and produces, depending on the species, I understand between 10 and 30% of their food, uh, of the energy. So they're a vital part of, their, of the coral. And when the uh, conditions are not right, the, those algae just get, uh, just, I, I expel from the coral. Or they, so then the coral loses the color and they look white, okay. which is just their skeleton. If that happens, just like when you're starved, if you, you can handle no food for a little bit, and then if it, too much time happen, uh, goes by, then the coral dies. I see. Okay. Um, so basically, yeah, we, we've seen how you fix them. So can you tell us more about your program and, and how you're developing sure. these things? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things that we uh, came up with was an idea or a way of evaluating products and services that are out there. Right. And we realized besides the bleaching and the heat events that we were having to deal with, a lot of the stressors that coral see are man-made. In fact, the majority of them are. Right. So when you add all that up, it, it becomes the problem for coral. So although we can't change the climate issues, we can change what man does. Okay. So we've come up with a program that we call the Reef Smart. And if you could pull up slide four, uh, this is a certification that we will give a product or a service uh, that we, we take the, the product and we evaluate our scientists. And if we feel that it's, it's, it's something that's appropriate to be around reefs and it won't harm them, <clears throat> then it's a product we will enforce. And there are companies that, that, that have services that are on land that have nothing to do with the water, but their runoff can affect the water. So basically, this is something that we want to look at um, for any product, any company, sunscreens, uh, wetsuits, and things like that. Uh, we've run across a wetsuit that is, uh, is very reef safe and, reef, and we've certified it as a reef smart product. Uh, one of the things we like about this is the extra flotation. It allows people to lie prone. And if we could jump to a slide... Well, seven. Sorry, we're jumping around. I'm sorry, not seven. Why five. You, why don't you go to five and show yeah. you know, what the problem is? And this is a big issue that we have in Hawaii. Besides the sunscreen issues, uh, people, you know, naturally when they stand up, they're going to stand on live coral, and it's it's basically in harm. And, uh, so with the, the floating wetsuit, and this is a company called Airtime Watertime, these wetsuits basically allow you to lie prone, and it's a very, very comfortable way to watch coral. Uh, it's very difficult to stand up. You can dive down. You can take a look at the coral just like you may have done in the past. But it, it allows a snorkeler, particularly an inexperienced one, to relax and feel comfortable and not stand on the coral. And again, it, 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 because of the comfort level, there's less panic and they tend to enjoy the experience a lot more. So this is a particular product we've run across. We're endorsing with our program that we feel is, is real important. We, we would love to see these wetsuits all throughout the state of Hawaii. 
So when we were prepping just before we started the interview, you were telling us about this wetsuit. It also has some safety features that are really interesting. So Yeah, it's not a certified PFD by the Coast Guard, but it does give you a few pounds of flotation. And from my experience and an experience of clients have used it, it allows for a much more relaxed situation. And a lot of drownings happen because of panic. Even experienced divers, when they start to panic, it, you, go, you go downhill very, very quickly from there. And the experiences that we've seen with the, the people that use these wetsuits, that's just not the case. People are very relaxed. And even if they do completely panic or pass out, you generally will roll over and face up. So there is a degree of safety that comes along with the wetsuit that we're real thrilled about. Yeah, that sounds like a great thing to have. It is. I would think the Navy would be interested in that. If it's, for example, a man overboard situation. Uh, yeah. Um, if the guy's treading water, all you see is a head. But if you have the whole body and it's in, and and you know, like a either a yellow suit or a red suit, they can actually see them in the water. Right, right. And we have the adult suits are the red versions, and then they, if we could go to slide seven, there's a kids version that are bright yellow and blue. Um, yeah, there we go. So real easy to see your kids when they get in the water. But you're right. If somebody fell overboard uh, or got into trouble, they're pretty easy to yeah. spot. But again, it gives you a degree of safety, a degree of comfort, and more importantly, it protects the coral, which is the reason we gave it that uh, the certification. So, how long is the uh, how long have you been going on this project? Well, I guess it'd be a three years in April when we met. <clears throat> We've been actively at this for a little over two years out yeah. here, um, and it's it's been an exciting ride. It's been really interesting. So, have you deployed any of these? Uh, 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 the nurseries or nurseries here not in yet not yet yeah. uh, we're looking to do one in fiji hopefully sometime this year later in the year yeah. it's it's a big project in fact if you want to jump to a uh, slide eight <clears throat> there's a rendering of what they will look like uh, we spent a great deal of time engineering this out and working with scientists and engineers and what you see here is the tanks are basically the coral nurseries that's where we grow our little babies uh, the tanks on either side, the, the containers on left and right are wet labs and, and uh, dry labs where we do the actual cutting and work. And then we do the dry labs where we just do the assembly and the, the concrete mixing. The, the, the container on the back side is sleeping quarters for our scientists and a little office. That, uh, that little radar dish up there, satellite dishes, connecting all the equipment and temperature sensors back to our scientists here in Hawaii right. so that we can remote control and, and, and uh, deal with any kind of issues that are going right. on. And the goal is to set up these all around the world. But basically, when we get a lab there, we, we work with the local people. It isn't just us there. We bring them in. Right. And we have buy-in in the, the project we're looking at in Fiji, where the local uh, chiefs and folks would love to work with us. And the hope is if we're down there for about two years, that's enough to get the reef started. And we'll continue on with them. And probably in two to five years, they should return enough of the reefs that should return their, their fishing grounds that they once had. So what about local um, permitting and uh, you know these man-made barriers that we have? What, what's been your experience? Is that gonna be an issue? Like for example, here in Hawaii, it takes quite a long time to get any kind of a project going and especially you know, you know, along the shoreline. So what's been your experience there? Well, Hawaii is challenging. Uh, they have a lot of safeguards in place and, and I applaud the state for doing this because what I think their logic is, is they, they, would, they, don't, they don't wanna take a chance and harm what's out there. And we agree with that. Coral is very sensitive, and I think a lot of scientists have done things over the years thinking they would help. Maybe they help one thing, but they create problems in another. This has happened in Kaneohe and other parts of the island. Right. So they're like very the mongoose. Like the mongoose, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we love mongoose. A lot of stories on that. Yeah, right. But uh, the state is is conservative, and we, again, I applaud that. I think that's important. But we are working with them, and there there is probably an opportunity for us to do some coral uh, plant out planting out here in the next few years. That's our hope. So when do you think you'll actually be able to do some offshore planning? I mean, you know, how far along that? Uh... Well, I, I would say Fiji. Fiji, we have everything as a go. The government uh, is, is you know, we're fine doing that. It's yeah. just a matter of raising funds, and we're doing fundraising for that project. I'd like to say by the end of the year we'll be out there doing surveying, but certainly within a year, year and a half, I'd, I'd like to have the lab that you just saw on the screen uh, launched out there. So Suzanne, so when you go to uh, a place like Fiji, do you import uh, Hawaii coral or do you look at the, uh, the local coral and, uh, and try to find the ones that are survivors? Yeah, no, that's a good question. No, we cannot uh, import from another place. That's not, uh, would not be safe. It's not really what the ec ecosystem there needs. So, but the techniques that you, that we learn here can be applied all across uh, every coral. Yeah. So we would, um, we would go there, we would uh, harvest a coral there and we'll take small pieces and then make them reproduce 
and grow faster than they would uh, if left alone, and then replace them. Okay. Yeah. Um, so um, one of my questions is, mm -hmm. how can we help and what can we do? I mean, how, how are you funded? I mean, is this all out of your own hip pocket or? Uh, largely it has been. It, yeah. it, we're, we're a nonprofit and we're privately funded. The, we put in the bulk of the funds, but we do have a number of private donors. But that is a big effort of ours. So yeah. to, to be able to, to, to do these remote labs, they're about a half a million, $600,000 endeavor. Um, so it does take money. We're looking at corporate sponsors. I'm talking with Memorial Reefs International. I think they're going to sponsor one of our labs. Uh, they've got operations in Mexico and in Italy uh, and probably some in the South Pacific coming up. So that's one of the organizations we're working with. We're also talking with other, other large companies that uh, uh, hopefully will be interested in, in uh, saving the coral reefs. And, and it also comes down to the individuals. I mean, it, there's a lot of people that have sent in $20, you know, $100, right. uh, little donations. Uh, they all add up. So it's, it's, uh, it's for a lot of the efforts that we, we, we do out here, fundraising is a big part of what we have to do. So what about government support? How, how's, uh, how's that been? Well, the government's been very supportive. Um, we've, we've talked with a number of legislators and representatives, and they're very, very excited about what we're doing. Uh, financially, obviously, there's nothing they can do, but I think they will, they will probably help when the regulations uh, come down uh, in the future as far as us doing work in Hawaii. I think we, right. we definitely have, we'll have some green lights there. Okay. Yeah, we have some supportive. funding for the... Uh... The coral wall. Yeah, because we have a coral education center planned mm. where people can come in and learn about what the coral is, how it, uh, how is, uh, how important it is for the Hawaiian tradition, uh, uh, and uh, how it is affected by what we do and what sure. can they do. So, in that coral education center has been uh, with the Hawaiian Tourism Authority has helped us with some fun, some of the funding there. What about OHA? I mean, are they, is that all part of the Hawaiian tourism uh, thing? We, we have not talked to them yet, but yeah. uh, certainly a, a, that's something that's on our list. So what are the, uh, what's been your experience here at NELHA? I mean, uh, this is in a way government support because NELHA started out as a government uh, funded operation, although now it's uh, self-sufficient. But tell us about the the systems and the support uh, that you've been getting out of the NELHA site. Sure. Yeah. Well, facilities are fantastic, what we're doing. And of course, the people who work here have been great to work with. We really appreciate their support. Mm -hmm. What's unique about this location for us is that NOHA has two pipes that go into the water. One is at 80 feet and pulls up surface water, which is what our coral needs. They also have another one that goes down several thousand feet that has very cold water. And with that, we were able to perfectly control the temperature so that we can mm -hmm. keep our coral at, at an optimal temperature. There's very few places in the world that have that, uh, that ability, so we're, we're very excited about being here. That, that's a big plus for us. Okay. So I noticed Hatch, uh, this uh, Hatch organization is an entrepreneurial uh, uh, organization. Um, have you had any interaction with them? Is there any interest uh, from that point? Well, or? not at this point. We've talked. Yeah. I know we know who we are, we, each other is. We've, we've definitely yeah. chatted. Uh, you know, their their mission is to to do uh, on land, typically on land, uh, food, uh, food, fish, food and raising. For profit. Yeah. yeah, and therefore a profit. Um, but the coral reefs, I don't think they're going to impact their their clientele at this time. So I'm not sure if we're going to be able to do anything together. Okay. Yeah. So uh, what have I missed? <laughs> what you, what's uh, what's a burning issue that you uh, want to uh, talk about? Well, um, That's a trick question. Good question. <laughs> um, you know, we do tours out here. So anybody who, oh, who okay. join, comes out to the Big Island right next to the airport, uh, please come by. Uh, look us up on our website. We'll have a slide at the end here. Uh, certainly take a look. If the people are interested in volunteering, uh, it really doesn't matter what your background is. We always have a need. Uh, uh, for people of all uh, skills, skills and talents, whether you're a biologist or an accountant, uh, yeah. volunteers are a big part of what we're doing. Uh, fundraising is a big part of what we're doing. If anybody has any ideas on that, certainly we'd love to entertain that. Uh, and of course, donations, cash donations or something that, that, that that's what we work off. So what about volunteers? I met Dot the other day. <laughs> she's great. And she's great. And, yeah. uh, and uh, what about having students out here, you know, uh, supporting you? I mean, as uh, maybe part of their educational program? Uh, we have a number of the schools that visit us. I think we've had over 500 kids here last yeah. year. We'll probably have two, three times that coming here. Right. Uh, we're working with uh, WEA, WEA HPA, and HPA, and I believe Parker's coming up as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. we do. We I think with WEA, we actually have a program where the kids come down and they're, they're working on projects here, and they also have a coral project up there that would help and support. Okay. Um, 
So what other kinds of donations are you looking for? So, for example, uh, we recently donated a shipping container to you guys. Yes, you did. Thank and, you very much. Uh, I know there's all sorts of shipping containers out there. I mean, they seem to be the, uh, the uh, architectural um, building of choice out here, especially since sure. you can set it up and then you ship it anywhere in the world. So talk us a little bit. Yeah, yeah besides cash donations, certainly uh, in-kind in donations, stuff, yeah. uh, containers, uh, we had a homeowner donate a, a large 16-foot tank. I've never seen a fish tank that large in my no life. No kidding, really? Yeah, they took a moving van and two forklifts, but we, it's, it's sitting in your container right now. <laughs> but, and out of the blue, we got a phone call from somebody who just said, do you need this? And, it, and this is what we're building our core wall around. And this would have been cost us twenty to $40,000 to build. And uh, the fellow uh, donated, which we're very grateful for. So if somebody has something in mind that is related to what we do, or not even uh, related to the marine life, uh, we'd certainly be interested in talk, chatting with us. So them. what's a coral wall? Coral wall, okay. Well, basically we're gonna take the 16 foot tank and we're gonna build it into a, a small room uh, downstairs here at Nelha. Uh, it stand out from the wall about six feet. And on the wall, on, on the wall besides having the, the tank of coral and fish, we're gonna have iPads and headsets where you can put on and you can give yourself a tour. You basically you enter in what your age is so we can appropriately uh, gauge the tour for the right. experience level, age level. And we can basically take you through a 15 minute tour of what's going on in the world of coral and what you can do to help. So are, uh, are coral also phosphorescent? I mean, do they give off light at night? You ever looked at that? Because you know, if you wave your hand in the ocean at night, it's an old diver's trick, like when you're looking for mines under a ship, it's like, yeah. You wave your hand and you get this phosphorescence, you actually see stuff. So Some of them do. Some of them okay. do. And then that, remember that the coral, most of the time, is a little animal. It's inside the, inside the skeleton. So yeah. at night, it has to, the polyp has to come up to actually, uh, and I think that's the part that flourishes. Okay. And the ones that do. Okay. <laughs> so we're winding down. Um, you are a nonprofit. So that means yeah. anybody that donates gets a tax. They right. do. Is that is that correct? That is and correct. So can we have the uh, last slide up there with the contact information? All right. So give a pitch. <laughs> well, like I said, saving reefs, feeding people, and it's uh, it's not about just the reefs. When we when we're able to rebuild a reef, we're restoring the uh, food source for native people around the world. So uh, give us a hand, and then come out and visit us. Yeah. Yeah. So I've seen their facility. It's right beside my hydrogen. I got to get a plug in for my hydrogen yeah. facility. So it's right it's beside awesome. my hydrogen facility, and it's a pretty neat. They call it the tea house, and it's a it's a nice little setup there. And so it's very worthy of a, of a visit. And it sounds like you're doing great stuff. And thank you. It's amazing that it's not amazing, but it's really good that you, you know, self funded this out of your own hip pocket to make the world a better place. So. Congratulations of, to both of you for like dedicating uh, you know part of your careers and lives to getting this done. Thank so, you, much. Bill. Thank you so much. My pleasure. And Suzanne, great meeting you. Thank you. It's good to have a doctor on on staff as well, <laughs> just in case. Yeah. So that uh, that's why we're winding up now, and uh, we'll be back next week. I don't know who our guest will be, but this is uh, Hawaii, the state of clean energy, and signing off. So aloha, y'all. <laughs> Thank you.